Let me welcome everyone to uh, our noontime event today, uh, which I am very, very pleased to, to introduce. Um, Dimitri Trenin has written another book. And this book, uh, not unlike his last one, I think is a very thought-provoking and challenging book intellectually. And it's one that asks us to rethink many assumptions. <coughs> Dimitri's very good at that. Uh, most of you know him. I don't think he needs a big introduction for this audience, but he is in the director of our Moscow Center for the Carnegie Endowment. Uh, he has been with Carnegie for, what, 15 years? More than that. More than um, that. 18, maybe. Okay. And he uh, is uh, the author of uh, sort of regular series of articles, books, and so forth that look at Russia's uh, contemporary developments and its relations with the outside world and internally. Um, we've asked uh, another longtime friend of mine and well known to many people who served in Moscow in the 90s, David Hoffman, to uh, provide some provocative questions to Dimitri or to get him talking about his book. Uh, David uh, is uh, most recently written uh, a, a book called Dead Hand. Uh, and uh, tells me he was just in Moscow to introduce its Russian translation around town uh, to a, a rather interesting and I think a diverse set of, of audiences. But David uh, was correspondent for the Washington Post in Moscow when uh, a number of us were there. Uh, he has written a book on the oligarchs and the most recent book is on arms control. And uh, so I'm simply here to introduce these people, welcome you, and uh, we'll have some back and forth between David and Dimitri to begin, and then we'll engage the audience uh, in uh, the discussion. So welcome all of you, and thank you very much for coming. And I will that turn it over to you, David. Great. Thank you. It's great to see all of you here. I know that the uh, weather outside is lousy, and people are very, very busy. But I have to tell you, I think this book uh, will be worth your time. It is absolutely brimming with great analysis and wisdom. And I was forced, as I read it, to catalog some of my own mistaken assumptions in the 90s and the last decade. So I, I feel humbled before Dimitri for this piece of work. Um, I hate to give you a spoiler, but there's a very important sentence in the conclusion of the book, which I must read to you. And it's very simple. The Russian Empire is over, never to return. Uh, this is Dmitri's conclusion, but on the way to getting there, he takes us through 20 years of very, very important history. And I think that what he has done is to actually stand on the cliff where Russia was 20 years ago, look into the abyss, and then tell us a little bit about why and how Russia and all the successor uh, states of the former Soviet Union did not fall into that abyss. And it's quite a story. It's quite an interesting one. And it's a challenging one. And I'll hear, I'd like to explain why briefly. All of you, I'm sure, remember that in December 1991, that was a pretty scary abyss that Russia faced. And I think we could all make long lists of the possible outcomes that would be uh, very, very unpleasant for the rest of the world, not the least of which was nuclear weapons being hauled in uh, cattle cars back from the frontier, or the bizarre uh, command and control system over the weapons that did exist, four republics with them, not to mention the ethnic and other uh, distributions that seemed to be a roadmap for disaster. And in the book, uh, Dimitri tells us that actually Russia has gone through four crises in this period since the mid-1980s. It let go of communism. It abandoned central planning. It walked away from the Cold War confrontation and gave up the imperial state. And the consequences of that, I think, are laid out in this book in such a clear and analytical fashion that we can begin to get a much better grip 20 years later on what really happened. And as I read it, I began to think about what hadn't happened that I certainly feared might have when I was a correspondent there and frequently at Dimitri's edge of his desk asking him for his advice about what was going on. And a quick list 
there was not a nuclear conflagration, and all the nuclear weapons were safely returned to Russia. Russia did not attempt to restore the empire. There is not a failed state among the former Soviet republics in Dmitry's analysis. Russia itself is a unitary state and a country, if not yet a nation, as Dmitry puts it, and we'll talk more about that. Most of the former republics are comfortable in their own skin. There are a few conflicts, but there is not really a large scale dispute about the, the, the borders. But for all that didn't happen, the tension in this book is to, and what Dmitry challenges us to think about, is how does Russia go forward? How does a shrunken empire, a shrunken state, cope with its own rather big ambitions? How does a weakened state go about realizing those ambitions or accepting them, the fact that it cannot realize them? And here I think we get to the exact uh, inflection point where we stand today and with the news of the weekend that uh, Vladimir Putin will resume the mantle of the presidency. Um, what kind of shrunken empire will he be leading and what kind of pressures will be bearing down upon him as he does that are the kind of things we want to talk about today. So I'd like to put a few questions to Dmitry and then of course we're going to open it up for everybody to go after him. But um, at first I'd like to put this question to you because it's a big part of your book. And that is this, why did this empire collapse without all those terrible things happening that we predicted? In other words, in, in post-imperium, why not more chaos? Well, uh, well, David, first of all, thank you for, for agreeing to do this. It's, um, it's a great honor for me that uh, you're sitting here and you've read the book, and you are putting those questions. I think it's, it's, it's very important that we um, that we stop taking the collapse of the Russian imperial state for granted. I think that's what many of us did back in, in the early 1990s. The Soviet flag was hauled down from the Kremlin, and that was supposedly it. Uh, it was not. And I think we're, li we're living today with the consequences of, uh, of a process which uh, has almost run its course, but it's still, it's still impacting on the lives and policies of uh, not just Russia, but other countries as well. I think to address your question uh, squarely, you would have to recognize the importance of the uh, Gorbachevian moment in Russian history. I think that, uh, if anything, Glasnost revealed to the Russian people the horrors of their history which many of them had not been fully aware of. And I think what Glasnost also, Glasnost and other things that were part of the process that Gorbachev launched, um, Glasnost uh, somehow convinced the people in Russia to put themselves above other things, such as ideology, religion, and even their own state. Uh, I think what's important to realize is that uh, the, uh, the state all of a sudden ceased to be what it had always been in, in, in Soviet history and what it, it, it had largely been in Russian imperial history, something which is more important than the people who live in that state. I think with, with Gorbachev empowered, and Gorbachev I use uh, for shorthand, Gorbachev empowered the people, and they put uh, themselves first. And that, I think, uh, led to, uh, to many interesting things. The, the people who were in charge of the ideology in, in the Soviet Union, um, they traded ideology, which was worn and basically useless. No one believed in that. 
they exchange it for other things, more important to them, more lucrative um, things. Uh, the people who uh, were supposed to guard the Soviet Union from external threats uh, had become tired of being used by Gorbachev and others in the various domestic conflicts. This is not, if you want to keep an army in, in, in good shape, you never tell the army, you never ask the army to do the domestic stuff for you. And Gorbachev clearly abused the army in that sense. So when the Soviet Union was teetering toward that abyss, that edge of the cliff, uh, the army, and that I think was the most, uh, I may be biased, frankly, because I served in the military in those days. But I think that the Soviet army were, the uns in some ways, the unsung heroes of, of, of the transformation. Because, uh, you know, normal people do not give, uh, uh, in, in, in Russia, do not give an, uh, an oath of allegiance. The military people had to give an oath, to, uh, oath of allegiance to the state. And that it meant something. You, you sometimes have to give your lives for that. Uh, and they never cared about um, saving the Soviet Union by the time the Soviet Union was nearing collapse. They, 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 um, they withdrew their support from, from, from the Soviet Union, and that was very important. And there were many other things. Uh, all of a sudden, it, um, it dawned on, on the people that uh, they needed to walk away from the shell, which um, had become um, basically non-performing and, and empty for them. And that, that's, that's when the Soviet Union collapsed. There are many other things. It's, uh, um, it's, it's one of those uh, uh, rare moments in history when an empire, is a communist empire, and a nuclear empire, uh, decides to dissolve itself peacefully. If you compare that record with the record of other empires in the 20th century, you'll probably come to the conclusion that uh, the, the exit from the Russian Empire was by far the, well, the least bloody exit. There was blood, no question. There was pain. But if you compare that to what might have been and what happened, actually, in other cases, you would see that that was surprisingly, surprisingly uh, easy exit. But, of course, the, the underside of it, is that uh, 20 years after the end of the empire, we're still living with, uh, with uh, a lot of old um, baggage, mental baggage, a lot of old stuff. And if you listen to, uh, this is the last thing I will say, Nasri, I, I know I, I've been talking far, 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 far along, but in, in answering your, your, your first question, I would say that if you were listening to the people in Moscow and the people uh, in, 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 in some places around Russia, and maybe far away from Russia, you wouldn't know that the Russian Empire is over. If you listen, you think it's still there. If you, if you go in, if you look around, if you, if you look at what people do rather than what it, at what people say, then you will know the answer, I think. Let me follow up with that a little bit because why we're still on this question of why did it happen before we look ahead. One of the things you point out in your book is that the great fears that many of us had about sort of a rolling ethnic collapse, a nationalistic breakup, it sort of stopped. In other words, we had certainly the centrifugal forces that Gorbachev unleashed, um, the Union falling apart. We did have sort of the, the attempted secession of Chechnya. But in many, many other ways, uh, all these fault lines of nationalism and ethnicity didn't crack. The uh, millions of Russians in marooned in Kazakhstan uh, didn't, you know, over and over again, it seems to have settled where it was. Uh, to what do you attribute that? Well, there's an interesting thing about, um, about this imperial collapse. Uh, unlike in many other cases, um, unlike the decline and fall of the British Empire, let's say, the initiative in this case, in the Russian case, came from the metropolitan part of the empire. It was the Russians, uh, crucially, who had grown tired of um, shouldering the imperial burden. And uh, with Russia leading the way, rather than Ra Russia standing in the way, 
you, you had the, the dynamic that, that, uh, that you described, David. And also, there's another thing about the Russian people. Uh, because uh, uh, the Russian Empire is as old as, uh, it's now deceased, but it was as old as, as uh, St. Basil's in Moscow, which was the, the first monument to the Russian Empire. That's where Russia forfeited its uh, historical option of becoming a nation state and instead started amassing other people's lands and other peoples within its uh, imperial boundaries. Um, the 400 plus year uh, history, essentially the ethnic imperial history, essentially the ethnicized the Russian. So who is a Russian? Anyone could be accepted into the Russian community if you, uh, if you add a patronymic to your name, and it's an easy thing to do, we all have fathers, um, and that's it. Uh, Georgi Georgievich Bush sounds very Russian. <laughs> and, and I'm sure that there may be a couple of people bearing that name in the Russian Federation. That's, that's not a problem. Uh, so when people think about uh, ethnicity, uh, maybe not last, but it's certainly not first. You walk into the uh, another cathedral in Moscow, Arsavia's Cathedral, the one restored next to the Kremlin on the, on, the, on the place of the former swimming pool. And you look at the plaques devoted to the officers in the Russian Imperial Army in 1812, 1815, who fought against Napoleon, of course. Um, around a third of the names would be Slavic. About a third of the names would be Muslim. And around a third of the names would be Western European. So that's the Imperial Army. The, the, the most patriotic, uh, it was said in the 19th century, the most patriotic servants of the Tsar bore German names. Uh, and uh, of course, the dynasty was uh, more German, much more German than it was Slavic or Russian. So you have this Imperial thing which uh, essentially uh, uh, may put uh, the state, the culture, and the language above ethnicity, and even above religion, because many of those German patriots of the Russian czars uh, were Protestants, or some of them were Catholics. Um, so that's, that, I think that's, that's part of it, the ethnicization of the Russian people, and their attachment to the, uh, to the empire and for, th for some of them, to the idea of the empire. And the, in the outlying areas, too, I mean, uh, uh, there, there must have been some factor there that prevented them also from bloodshed and further violence like we saw elsewhere in the world. Well, I'm, I'm, I would really want to commend, first of all, the Ukrainian people. Uh, it's, it's a small miracle that Ukraine has been able to keep itself within, within its borders, given the, the large Russian population, given uh, the, 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 uh, the complex nature of the Ukrainian territory. Uh, the fact that Ukraine was the only country, has been, well, not, not the only, but one of the very few countries in, 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 in the former Soviet Union that has not experienced any serious ethnic clashes is certainly a great contribution of the Ukrainian people, of whatever ethnicity, to uh, European security and worldwide well-being. Uh, in, in, in many other countries, uh, the, the process of Soviet modernization led to, um, to uh, the emergence of urban centers, uh, which were um, totally ethnic, multi-ethnic, and uh, uh, where ethnicity, uh, again, mattered somewhat less than it did elsewhere. It was also important in a certain way um, that uh, in, in, in the Soviet Union, uh, religion uh, was not, um, well, well, after what Stalin had done to religion in, in, in across the country, uh, religion did not become a, a focus of, of attention. And, and people did not, um, grad, did not reach out for their religious uh, uh, identity in many cases, and some they did, but not in many cases, uh, as, 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 um, as something that would um, uh, distinguish them from the others. Uh, and I, and I, I, I think that um, 
what applies to Russia applies to most other former Soviet states. They, they managed to get through uh, with uh, relatively little um, bloodshed, with relatively little conflict. Although Russia, of course, we're talking about Russia as if there has not, has not been a Chechnya. There was Chechnya. You, you, there, there is uh, instability in the North Caucasus even today. Uh, and, and, and Russia uh, is not wearing uh, white clothes, God forbid. But uh, again, judged against uh, the, um, the list of what might have happened, um, the Russians and the rest of the former Soviet Union have not done badly at all. You look also at the Baltic states. Uh, there were very, very few. There was some tension. There is some tension. But there were no clashes between the Russians and the, uh, and the, and the local uh, ethnic groups. And this is, uh, this is another contribution to, uh, to Europe's security. You know, Dimitri, I also, now that we've looked back a little bit, I like to look forward. And there's a, a page in this book that had, um, I thought, an exceptionally uh, pressing and penetrating comment. And I'd just like to read it and then ask you a question, because I see a little bit of a contradiction in your views about the future. You write that in present-day Russia, atomized society is not really bound by any barriers, official or conventional. The elite rise, but they do not lead and do not care to. The private definitely trumps the public. Seen from virtually any level of society, the state is too corrupt to inspire national consciousness. You say there is no imagined community of fate in today's Russia. So you've portrayed this atomized privatized state. And in the next page, you go on to say that uh, the people who lead Russia today clearly do not see democracy as a value. But, you say, they have uses for democracy's attributes as a legitimatizing instrument. And you suggest that an atomized society beholden to personalized power works for the time being. And you say this is a recipe for stability in post-Soviet Russia. But elsewhere in the book, you also say that you don't think that Russia can modernize economically without also modernizing politically. And I think you've been quite outspoken about discussing how political modernization has to be part of the equation. So I, I want to ask you sort of which is it? Is this uh, atomized, privatized uh, society led now by Putin and in the near future stable? Or is it something that essentially is stable only for stagnation? Can the Putin formula work um, beyond stagnation? Can it, can it work uh, towards some kind of uh, different future than the one we take as the conventional wisdom today that will be next? Well, I would say that uh, the Putin formula um, is uh, fine for uh, <laughs> preserving the, the, the status quo as long as uh, the challenges to the status quo are not overwhelming. And this may last, uh, who knows? Uh, I don't think it will last very long, but it will last a couple of years. It may last more than a couple of years. Uh, but it's, uh, it's clear that this formula does nothing to uh, take Russia away from this stagnation path. Um, and I think that before there is a political modernization, uh, there must be, and there is already, social modernization. So I use the notion of an atomized society to describe what Russia is today. It's uh, 140 million people, 42 million people, um, but they don't constitute a nation. Uh, the, the recipe for success, and even for survival, in post-Soviet Russia has been individual, um, an in individual effort. You, you, had to, um, you had to lean together on the walls of the Soviet Union so that they give way and, uh, and let you walk out of that walled in community or walled in um, space. But then what? 
it dawned on people that you would only be successful to the extent that you focused on yourself, not on, on the others. You talked, to David, about the, the 25, whatever, 30 million Russians uh, marooned uh, outside of the new borders of the Russian Federation. Did any Russians within the Russian Federation care about that? They did not. Most of them did not. It's just bad luck for you guys. You happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now, we can't do anything about it because, you know, we're, we're in the business of surviving or in the business of making money or, or in some other business, but it's our personal business. So what you have in Russia today is, um, and this is the private trumping the public, uh, my favorite uh, analogy, of course, is, is a normal Russian apartment block. You walk into that apartment block and you see that the door is, uh, is uh, not nice, not, paint, not freshly painted, not, not painted at all. The elevator is creaky. The, the cleaning lady has not been there for two weeks or three weeks or two months, I don't know. But then you walk into the apartment that you're visiting and the apartment is nice. It's actually newly refurbished, and it has all the amenities. And uh, well, actually, you can you can uh, sell it for a fairly high price. Uh, a square meter in Moscow, in central Moscow, would fetch I don't know, depending on the quality of of, of, of the apartment block, seven thousand dollars, eight eight thousand dollars. So you can buy fairly good uh, fairly good apartment um, in uh, in the United States, for example. That that's real money. Uh, when you look down from the window of your apartment, you will see new cars, and there will be ever newer cars. Uh, I don't think that there are many Soviet-made or Russian-made models anymore or in, in, in most, in, in most uh, courtyards in central Moscow. Uh, but then you, you come to the pretty unsettling conclusion that that uh, individualism has almost run its course. You live in this nice apartment, uh, but the, the staircase is dirty. The, the elevator needs replacing. And uh, no one will do it for you. Uh, you, can, you can have a nice car, but the roads are bumpy, and uh, the poorly, traffic is poorly regulated, and you, can, you cannot do anything about that. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, individualism is close to having performed its mission in, uh, in securing this passage. Any progress beyond where you are would require some common action. You would it would, that would require that the neighbors form, for example, that they form a condominium and start managing their, their affairs jointly. And this is just... Uh, a model for, for, for things on, on, a, on a far larger scale. And, uh, and this is where Russia is today. If, if Russian people uh, start collaborating horizontally, if they start, start reaching out to their neighbors, uh, the country will change, will start changing. And then the country which is, does not have a nation today might have something like a nation in the future. Uh, Russia today is not an empire, uh, but it's not a republic either. It's not a republic in the most basic sense of the word. There is no res publica. Everyone has his own res. That's the problem. But Russians being just uh, you know, a bunch of humans, uh, I don't think that they are so different from, from other people. They'll take their time, and I, I, you, would, you would see that at the social level, the way people, people go about their daily lives, the way people uh, think about their, uh, their kids, they think about their future, uh, there is modernization going on. And people are placing, uh, people uh, talking about the values, uh, mo many of the values that the, the, the urban people in, uh, in, in Russia, in, in, in Russian urban centers, the, the, the city dwellers, uh, have, they would be very close to the values of uh, the urban people uh, across the world. 
and uh, you do have this social uh, mobil uh, so social modernization. Whether it will lead to political modernization, I think yes. And uh, we can talk about some of the ways but, uh, uh, how this I mean, Let me just push you on that for a minute because you're getting close to the real unknown f about Russia's future, and that is many people have said Putin essentially has created uh, what one of your associates called a non-participation pact with people, that essentially he stays out of the kitchen, he stays out of their personal lives, the era of intrusion is over, and they stay out of politics, mm -hmm. and they stay out of civil society, they don't look out the window and think about contacting their neighbors, that everybody's happy in this atomized society. What's to prevent prime, uh, President Putin from essentially taking this forward in a Chinese model? Give no ground at all on politics, uh, control it, and, and try and satisfy people's individual desires and preserve that status quo. What threatens that? Well, I would say this. Uh, people do not normally uh, engage in politics unless uh, their real interests are affected. And you were absolutely right to point out that for a lot of people, uh, the, the current status quo today is just fine, especially compared, they do not compare their situation to the situation in the United States or France or, or, or China for that matter. They compare it to their own situation 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 30 years ago. So whether you, you compare that to Yeltsin, Gorbachev, or Brezhnev. And uh, you, you can make an argument that today's Russia is far more affluent than any other Russia that, that we've seen, and it's much freer than any other Russia, except for a brief period at, at the beginning of the 90s, which though Russia experienced during that period, Russia experienced much more freedom than it experiences now. Uh, that freedom came um, in combination with uh, a fairly uh, low level of, uh, of, 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 of living and uh, fairly dire situation for, for most people. And, and actually, freedom for a lot of people begins with their pocketbook. You can be free, but if you, uh, if you don't have enough money to buy yourself a good lunch, then uh, you're not, not as free as you might think. You may elect your president, but uh, you cannot, for example, send your, send your kid to uh, the seaside uh, during his vacation. And uh, th this is a different kind of freedom. Now, the freedom that, uh, that, that people today have um, uh, is, is, is fairly more substantial. It, it stops at the edge of, of the, the realm of the political. That's, that's correct. And now I think uh, the government and the people who for a long time have been living in two, two different universes, the government did, doesn't really, in Russia, the government doesn't really need the people for the money. The money comes from Gazprom, Rosneft, uh, something like 5% of the Russian uh, income, uh, federal income comes from, uh, from the people, from taxing the, uh, uh, the individuals. Um, and of course, the people, uh, well, they may look, they may, they may uh, paying attention to uh, the, uh, uh, the bureaucrats, uh, the corrupt bureaucrats becoming so rich on the job, uh, they will still console themselves by saying, it's, it's not my money, it's, it's their money. They're just dividing their money and I keep my money. So, you know, the two parallel universes. Uh, this has been going on for some time. Will it go forever? No. Uh, one of the things that Mr. Putin is fighting so hard for right now is a popular mandate. And this may one, be one of the reasons why he decided to step back into the presidency. Um, he sees the, situa the economic situation becoming more difficult for Russia. And uh, it's actually widely accepted in the country that uh, once the elections are over, the Russian government will start, uh, 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 will, will, will begin with, with a set of austerity measures. The Russian government um, has only been able to, uh, to keep, uh, 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 let me put it differently, uh, the break-even price for the Russian budget, the price of oil, has risen to 109. Uh, when Kudrin took over uh, as, uh, as finance minister, that, uh, that was in the low 30s. 
Now it's 109. Will it stay at that level? Probably not, if you're looking at the situation of, of Western economies and global economy. Uh, which may mean, that, which will mean, that the Russian government will impose itself uh, more seriously on the Russian people. Now, you, if you start doing that, people will start paying attention to how you're using their money. Uh, and uh, we can, uh, this, this can draw more people into the realm of the political without, uh, without the people. It, it, it won't be, right now, it's uh, for a lot of people who oppose the government, it's uh, more done out of, uh, I wouldn't call it abstract conclusions, but it, it comes from your heart. You know, it comes from your, uh, from your head, this opposition to Putin, Putinism, however you want to call it. Uh, but that only draws a small portion of the population into the realm of even political debate. When this will be about uh, people's core interests, if it's about the pocketbook, then a lot, lot more people will be uh, politically conscious. And I'm not saying that this will turn Russia into a liberal democracy. It may turn Russia into, it may help steer the course in it into a different uh, direction. But what I'm saying is that this uh, pact that you've referred to, uh, although it's still holding, it will not hold forever. And it may not hold for long, in my view. Well, that's um, interesting uh, and somewhat disturbing conclusion that uh, it's not really so stable and you're predicting change. So now's a good time for me to throw it open. Uh, please uh, raise your hand to be recognized and uh, please stand up and tell us who you are so everybody knows who's asking and we've got a good amount of time now. And I'm just gonna sort of go around the room randomly. So I'll start over here and we'll get everybody. Uh, my name is Hank Gaffman from CNA. And, uh, I know you started out in um, and did GRU debriefing people over in East Europe. Uh, no, I think you confused me with somebody else. Uh, not debriefing people from. Um, were you in GRU? No, I was not. You were in straight army. I was in straight army. Um, uh, people around me, some of the people around me, mm -hmm. were people from the GRU. Yeah. No, I was not. Okay. Um, so the question then. Is um, whatever as an army person, um, how is your consciousness shaped uh, toward this uh, big change that uh, took place? I understand you got your PhD at uh, around 1984 from Iskran, Iskan at that time. Um, how did your consciousness evolve across this time, given those connections? Right, uh, Mr. Gaffney, let me. Uh I think I would start, um, when I was 19, I was uh, sent to Iraq, of all places, by the Soviet military uh, to be an interpreter for the Soviet military assistance group in Iraq. And uh, what Iraq taught me uh, um, was that, uh, well, A, it taught me that there, there could be a, a government uh, in the world that was stricter on its people than the Soviet government. And that was a bit before Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein was still number two, that we're talking that in 75 and 76. So you still had that army general, Bakr, as president. Uh, but what uh, Iraq also uh, uh, gave me access to was not so much the, the Arab world, I do not speak the language and uh, I was dissuaded from attempting to learn Arabic. But uh, Newsweek was available in the streets of Baghdad, so I would uh, buy a copy of Newsweek every week and uh, read um, um, about the world through Newsweek. <coughs> so that was one window. Uh, when, I was, uh, when I was commissioned into the military, my first job was as a, a call it a liaison officer to the Western Allies in uh, the Berlin area, and I was in Potsdam. So uh, there were many things that I took away from that. Uh, every day I would have uh, eight 
uh, dailies in uh, three or four languages land on my desk. And I'd be often the sole reader of that stuff because no one, no one else was terribly interested. But you could uh, read the Herald Tribune, the Daily Telegraph, the Times, Le Monde, the, the Frankfurt Allgemeine uh, on a daily basis. You were also, uh, you also had access to uh, West German television, and I sp speak German. So you, you learn about the world. Mr. Putin, unfortunately, was he had to debrief people because uh, in Dresden, where he was uh, stationed uh, with the KGB, uh, you know, there's a topographical depression and they could not pick up West German television from Dresden. <laughs> so you had to talk to people <laughs> to know the truth. Um, Potsdam was, of course, West Berlin was around the corner. Um, and, and more importantly, I think, you, you had access uh, to people and uh, you, you engaged in, in private conversations with people uh, ranging from uh, corporals to uh, uh, four-star generals. The four, but the four-star general would normally be uh, in an interpreter's capacity. And with your peers, you would be just colonels. Uh, uh, well, I was a senior lieutenant captain, so very lowly uh, placed military officer. But you would talk to, to, to the, and you would, one thing I realized from, from, from Germany is that, or rather from my experience, that you can have uh, more and better communication with your peers across the borders horizontally than uh, with your own people vertically. And that came as, a, as, as one big insight. Another big insight, you had to sit in at uh, the meetings which were often contentious, that's why they were called, between uh, the Soviet military people and the Western military people about incidents. People were spying on each other, which helped to keep uh, the, the Cold War cold. So they were military uh, intelligence people, uh, Soviet, in the three zones of West Germany. There were three Western military missions in the GDR, and uh, everyone was uh, ri riding around uh, the place, so Germany was always being controlled from the inside as well as from the outside. Um, and uh, you, what you would uh, Always and since you you were there, you you were interpreting or taking notes in, in those meetings. You always you 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 realize that there is no such but well, there is such a thing as the truth, but it lies uh, between the sides. It doesn't belong to either side. The the Soviets would be saying you know, and you would know you would know from the inside that the Soviets were were saying the things that were convenient for them, and you would, you would know it from, from them, they would be. And you would also realize that the people in the West were, would be telling their own stories because of the position that uh, they had. It was all about catching people in unauthorized areas and doing other things, but it was fun. And for a young kid of 22, 23, 25, that was great learning, it was much worth, it was worth a, a university education, a second one. I'm so glad that I was part of that. But I can continue. I think I'd rather stop. There, was, there were other things, Geneva, uh, nuclear talks, and uh, many other things. And uh, well, I'd rather stop here. Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Temur Yakubashvili, Ambassador of Georgia. It's always good to see Dimitri and always inspiring to read his books because it's always very interesting, so I have a temptation to read as soon as possible. I have to admit I haven't read yet. So uh, first of all, I want to agree with Dimitri that Russian Empire is dead, but I disagree that it died in the 90s. It died in, during the revolution, the socialist revolution. Since that, we had no Russian Empire. We had the Soviet Empire, which was by all you know, assessment very much different from what the classical empires, big German, Austrian, or whatever, the British would be. So that's why putting uh, sort of uh, together dissolutions to other empires and the Russian Empire, which I would be calling Soviet Empire, is not exactly the correct thing to do because system of loyalty was different. System of loyalty in British Empire or the Habsburg Empire was to, towards the loyal family and the court. And in Soviet Union, it had something else. So you know it very well what we had. The problem, the second problem is that I'm not sure if the Russian current leadership is aware of the Russian empire is dead. 
And uh, behavior patterns, especially in our part of the world, tells you completely opposite. And all these ideas of, uh, you know, um, uh, spheres of influence, liberal empire, you know, uh, recognition of occupied territories, independence, and et cetera, and et cetera, it leads me to think that people in the top leadership of Russia still are not sure about if that empire is dead or not. But the biggest problem, I think, is that what Dimitri correctly mentioned, that Russians are not sure what kind of country they have. I know only two countries in the world with fluid borders, that's Russia and Israel. So in Russia, if you ask where Russia starts and ends, most of the people are not able to tell you where are the borders of Russia. And uh, my question will be, what will trigger uh, Russian either leadership or people to come to some kind of conclusion to build either nation state or to build a kind of federation, federal state, not on the paper but in realistic terms. And uh, when you refer to Russian uh, houses and entries, it was Soviet. I mean, we had exactly the same. Ukrainians had exactly the same. Uh, it takes this other kind of transformation to have a normal entrance in your house. Uh, but it has nothing to do with the state building in the classical sense. It's just different kind of social uh, changes that are happening when your government starts to deliver to public instead of stealing. And very last question, when we will switch from notion of making money to earning money? Because in Soviet Union, we had this very interesting notion that money have to be made, not to be earned. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ambassador, first of all, I, uh, I, I very much appreciate what, what, what you said. Um, and uh, it's always uh, interesting to hear from you. And uh, uh, you're very outspoken, and uh, your views are widely known, and uh, I think widely discussed. Um, I think you, you, you raised very important points. Um, to me, um, and that, that's, I think that's where uh, you stand where you sit, in a way, applies. Uh, to me, uh, since I was born and raised in Moscow, and uh, the, uh, the end of the Soviet Union was the end of the flag, flag more or less. Uh, to me, nothing more, well, there were other things, but uh, Moscow remained where Moscow was and uh, did not uh, move anywhere. Um, I think that to me, Soviet was um, Soviet stands for Russian communist. That's that's how I interpret it. It's uh, Soviet is uh, is is uh, a period in uh, in Russian history, and I say Russian because to me again, this is not ethnically Russian. So my Russian in let's say 1914 would include Georgia. Today it doesn't include Georgia. Uh, pardon. Uh, no, it doesn't. Well, we, we, we can talk about that. Um, uh, you talked about the borders of Russia. Uh, when I, when, uh, and I think you're absolutely right. But the question that uh, I'm most troubled with, and most people in Russia are troubled with, uh, are not the borders on the outside, but the borders on the inside. So when I uh, look at uh, the piece of the Russian Federation called Chechnya. I see it as a separate state, de facto. When I look at, uh, at, uh, uh, at Chechnya's neighbors, in Gushetia, Dagestan, and, 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 and others, I would say that uh, they're becoming de-Russified and they're becoming something very different. Uh, some people call it internal abroad which I think is, very, is a very applicable term. So the borders of Russia have started moving, but they're moving in the opposite direction. Now, uh, Abkhazia and, and South Ossetia, uh, well, you talked about the spheres of influence. I think that those are the only spheres of influence that Russia currently has. I don't think there's anything else. But that's, uh, that's, uh, that's what they are at this point. Um, 
I think it would be foolish of Russia to start thinking about reintegrating or integrating South Ossetia, with, uh, which to me is, is non-viable as a state, uh, into Russia. But something has to be done about that. My own, uh, uh, my own, uh, own idea about South Ossetia would be to make it into an Andorra in the Caucasus. So everyone would claim that it's somehow the Andorans would claim it, would, would, would be able to mint coins and print stamps and welcome people to their casinos. Uh, from the standpoint of the Georgian state, it will be part of Georgia, because Georgia will have some. And from the standpoint of Russia, they will have some droit de regard. And uh, it's not a very popular idea anywhere. But, uh, <laughs> but at least um, uh, that's, that's how I would look at, at South Ossetia. Uh, Abkhazia, I think, is a different case. Um, but again, uh, I don't think I, I, I need to go very much into that. Uh, it, but but, but you're, you're, you're absolutely right. The borders of Russia are, are somewhat, um, somewhat being challenged. But, but the challenge, again, I would say the challenge is coming from within. I, would, I will not willingly go to Chechnya, frankly, although it's part of the Russian Federation. The number of Russians in Chechnya is close to zero. Before the war, there were 400,000 Russians. My own driver who drives me uh, and my colleagues at Carnegie is born in Grozny. Will he ever want to go there? Do we ever think about reintegrating those 400,000 people? The number of Russians in Dagestan has gone down, as you know, to 2%, 3%. In Gusheti is Russian free. That's what we're talking about. Uh, the rhetoric, uh, I, I said at the beginning, I'm absolutely uh, in agreement with you on that. If you listen to what people are talking to, uh, in Moscow and in some other places, you will, you will not know that the Russian Empire is dead. The people in Russia are often using the rhetoric as some kind of a self-therapy. It's a difficult thing to exit from an empire. And you will talk about it as if it were there, but in reality, it is, it is no longer there. And I think one of the strongest proofs that I have in my mind, you know, there, there, there's official talk and there's subconscious something. And that sometimes it, it goes into the open, uh, the subconscious thing. Uh, you would recall that Putin, or you may not recall that, but Putin, uh, speaking about a year ago during a call-in interview with the Russian people for a four-hour marathon, uh, had to take a question about Ukraine. And he said a remarkable thing, a totally outrageous thing, which is very interesting. He said, we would have won the Second World War even without Ukraine, which means that not only today, or in the past 20 years, does he not see Ukraine as part of us, as part of Russia? But even he projects that back into, the, into history. So even in the, in the mid 20th century, Ukraine was somehow not Russia. A very interesting thing. Pardon? He it's not the state at no, he, he basically, no. His, his message was that it's a very fragile state and handle it with care. I think that's what he meant. Uh, I will not be commenting on Putin's uh, statements here. Um, I don't think it's, uh, you know, artificial. You can, you can all say that uh, the borders of the Soviet Union were artificial. Internal borders of the Soviet Union were artificial. There are many Russian nationalists who just say that. The interesting thing that I found out when I was uh, researching for this book was that the borders of the Russian Federation uh, very closely conformed to the borders of the Tsardom of Muscovy, circa 1650, before Russia embarked on its imperial quest. So Kiev was not there, uh, the Caucasus were not there, Kazakhstan was not there, Belarus was not there, the Baltic states. So it was um, basically the borders of, and, and the interesting thing also is that in, you, you evoke the Russian Empire. In 1917, the, uh, the territories of the, of, of, of the Russian Empire that defected from the core were exactly the territories that were not part 
of the Tsardom of Moscow in 1650. It's interesting. It's, so this is my argument to my own people when they say it's all artificial and run the Russian Federation and they never lived in those borders. That's, tr that's wrong. And, but self-therapy self is, is, is a good thing. I mean, it's, if you uh, gradually uh, come to realize the, uh, the real, that the reality is there to stay, that's fine. And what kind of a country? It was said of a different country um, 60 years ago that it had lost an empire and, and not found its new role. I think it applies to Russia. And uh, it's, 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 I wouldn't call it a tragedy. The you, you, a country has to reconceptualize itself in a totally new way. And it, it will require time. And unlike the country I have alluded to, it is not, uh, it's, it, it is not a, an ally of a, of a mighty world power. It's not part of a, of a continent-wide integration process. It's basically on its own, which is fine, but which is more difficult. Thank you. Uh, Wayne Mary, the American Foreign Policy Council. I might note that some of former Capitan Trenin's American counterparts in Potsdam remember him very fondly. And I think that that this was- This is reciprocated. I think that was an educational process in both directions. And where we are today may demonstrate the, the, the benefits of military-to-military -military contacts, <laughs> often very unpredictable. <laughs> Dimitri, uh, I've, I have read the book. I have not the hes slightest hesitation both praising it and recommending it. But I'd like to ask you a question about something you don't go into very much in the book, and that's elite group attitudes. In the book is a very excellent description of the reality of post-imperial Russia and of what's happened in the last 20 years. You discuss, to some extent, public attitudes in Russia, but not elite group attitudes. And it seems to me that that's rather important because elites in great powers are often perhaps, shall we say, a little abstracted from reality. Uh, I won't go in any sort of local examples, uh, <laughs> but just in another post-imperial ex uh, instance, uh, in 1956, uh, the elites in Britain and France not only thought that they could conduct a successful military operation in Suez, they genuinely believed it would be a policy success and would lead to a restoration of a good deal of their greatness and grandeur. So I'd like you to discuss a bit, not reality, but what people in the upper, say, five or 6,000 people of Russia, what do they think of this reality? To what extent is that rather amorphous concept uh, Derzhovnost? Uh, does it affect their sense of Russia internally? Russia externally, uh, and to what extent is this sense of uh, their role of legitimacy from Derozhovnost tied in with their response to both external stimuli and uh, to their own political needs? Well, Wayne, thank you so much for this. I think it's a key question. Um, uh, David quoted from the book saying that the elites arise, but they do not lead. Uh, and that's, to me, a, a key point, or maybe the key point. Uh, the elites in Russia do not perform the core function of the elite as leaders of society. The elite in Russia uh, are focused primarily, and I would say exclusively, on themselves. They would employ, often, their javne discourse. Uh, Maybe in order to get themselves uh, some kind of, um, of um, um, uh, justification for doing what they're doing, because they kind of know that what they're doing is a bit unholy. So to make it holy, they inject a dose of anti-Americanism into their discussions. Then they would look more patriotic. And patriotism is, is depending how you view it, could be an extremely uh, cheap and um, useful good. You can, on the Duma floor, you can engage in, uh, in, in the vitriols against uh, uh, outside threats against Russia, but you will spend most of your time, actually 99% of your time, but making yourself rich on the Duma floor because there are countries where you 
uh, become rich before you join the government, their country, uh, and after you quit the government. And their country is like Russia, where you grow rich while you are in government. That's while you uh, loathe I, I to I think you had said earlier, quit. Russia is ruled by those who own it. Exactly. And that's, that, that's, that's the key point. Um, so those elites are not so much abstracted from the reality. I think that they are more, well, they are more realist uh, in many ways than I am. Because they know how money is to be made, and uh, you know, I and I probably don't. Uh, but uh, they uh, are divorced from uh, uh, from the country. The the interesting and and maybe one of the things I I, I will need to to emphasize here again that uh, the end of the Soviet Union uh, was uh, in many ways a unique experience. It's not that. Uh, if you, if, let's say, you live, in, you live in Georgia and you see the end of the Soviet Union as, uh, as, as national liberation. You may see it differently, but, but some people would see, or, m or maybe, maybe the majority of people will see it as national liberation. When you sit in Moscow, it, what, what, what's, what happens is that uh, your state, which you thought was eternal, which, was, which had its hand everywhere, all of a sudden, it collapses, and you, you are present at the funeral of your country, in a way. The country dies, and you walk on. And you move on, and you, you also discover that it's actually better to live without uh, that state above you, or maybe around you. And uh, uh, it's, it's a very uh, unusual feeling that a lot of people, I think, imbued during the 1990s. And then the state came back, but, but that was uh, after the, the, the decade of essentially um, the state lying in a coma in Russia. So uh, Dervnost, I think, is, is, is just a, a, comp a way of, to compensate themselves uh, and to win some kind of, uh, I wouldn't call it support, but some kind of uh, maybe well, you may call it justification for whatever you're doing to enrich yourselves, and uh, that's how I see it. Uh, Takao from NHK Japan Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, I'm glad to see you again. I worked in Moscow office for five years, so I had a chance to interview a couple of times. Thank you. And I have a question uh, that, uh, mm, what is your first impression of Putin's announcement of, you know, to go back to the president, uh, in fact? And uh, uh, mm, so is the Medvedev just simply the puppet of the Putin or how seriously he uh, thought to be the so independent authority to you know uh, reset the relation with the United States or the European countries, and how do you think the former uh, future relation with the West, with uh, West uh, of the you know the from Russia, uh, for example the. Uh, missile defense issue. What will happen next? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, that brings us back to the front pages of today's news. Um, there was a, it, it was surprising and, uns, and, and, not, and unsurprising what, what was said, what was announced at this United Russia Congress last Saturday. I think most people believe that uh, Putin was likely to um, to stop being a, an in, informal leader, a paramount leader for Russia, and that he would be he was getting ready to st to step back into the the shoes of uh, formal power uh, while keeping his informal power again with him. Uh, I was surprised, however, by uh, the uh, announcement that Medvedev uh, uh, would be Russia's prime minister and also uh, formal head of the party, under Putin, the paramount leader, of course. Uh, in my view, Medvedev uh, 
does not exactly fit for that role, but uh, the role may be redefined to accommodate Medvedev. So normally you, you view, you view of, 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 uh, since the late Soviet period, a prime minister in Russia is somebody uh, who is a technocrat, uh, an economist, a financier, uh, someone who looks uh, after the socioeconomic things. Uh, he is not the leader of the party, and he, um, he is not uh, an ideologue. And Mr. Medvedev, um, uh, well, he served as first vice premier, but uh, he is better known for other things. Uh, I don't think he was a puppet. I think he was, uh, he's always been a uh, junior partner to Mr. Putin, a willing junior partner, fully loyal to him. Putin uh, grades loyalty above all other qualities, or maybe most other qualities in humans. And uh, Medvedev passed the test. He never challenged Putin seriously. And when Putin decided he wants to go back, Medvedev obliged. So that's... Um, uh, Dimitri, doesn't it bother you that this uh, decision was made so arbitrarily? I, mean, I, I hate to raise the question, but you know, Gorbachev said not long ago, when these two were discussing their decision, he said, weren't there supposed to be some voters involved? And uh, you know, you describe in your book so eloquently this uh, atomization and um, all for himself kind of idea, and you seem to think there's some stability, but there'll be change. It seems to me, if I were sitting at my kitchen table, I would just say, see, it doesn't depend on me. They made the decision themselves. Aren't they really perpetuating this stagnation in a big way and telling people that it doesn't matter what you think? Well, absolutely. I think that's, that's exactly right. Uh, and it's uh, an insult to the Russian people. I think it was a very, un it was a very true, genuine, true, totally correct, very cynical um, statement uh, that we will sit down and discuss it be because that's, that's, uh, that's what they did. And they said that they were going to do just that. Uh, so they were fully, they didn't engage in hypocritical uh, rhetoric about that. But um, uh, no, this does not bring Russia closer to, to democracy, uh, clearly not. But on the other hand, uh, Medvedev is, um, is like the moon to Putin the sun, if I may say so. He, he shines with, with something that, uh, that's reflected from the bigger body. And uh, any, uh, if, if, if Putin were, if, if Medvedev decided to run against Putin, we know who would have won. I mean, general, I mean Medvedev's support is not that big. It would have, uh, that could have opened some floodgates for uh, public discussion. It would have, uh, the Kremlin perhaps argued, it would have destabilized the, the system. It would certainly have destabilized the bureaucracy and probably immobilized the, the, the bureaucracy uh, and many other things. But Putin, um, the two things that Putin brings to, to the Russian political system that uh, assure its relative stability. A, he has the, I wouldn't call it the support, I would call it the acquiescence of the populace. Uh, he reaches out to the people down there, way below where he sits. And he kind of appeals to a lot of people around him. So he procures the, um, I wouldn't, again, I would, I, would, I would hesitate to call it support, but he procures the acquiescence of the majority of the Russian people in the system that Putin has built. So this is one thing that he is doing. The other thing that he is doing, uh, he arbitrates uh, among the sharks who populate the upper echelon. It's not, uh, you know, it's not uh, a picnic to sit down with some of the oligarchs that you wrote about, David. And uh, especially to invite one of them, you know, to order one of them to, you know, come here and sign on the dotted line. And by the way, don't, you know, bring the, the pen back. And all that in front of TV cameras. Um, you know, it's, um, it's not a picnic, uh, the life at, 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 at the top of the Russian system. So those are the two things that Putin does. Medvedev doesn't bring in those things. He appeals, he goes where Putin can't, or Putin wouldn't. He goes to the young, he goes to the internet savvy people. Savvy people. He reaches out to the West, to the United States. The reset would not have been possible if the name of the Russian president had been Vladimir Putin. 
I don't think it would have been possible. Does that mean the reset won't be possible? No, going no, forward? the reset is there. So you, uh, you, 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 need, you need to continue to start, uh, well, reset today means that uh, uh, the United States uh, forces can um, travel across the Russian airspace in their thousands. Uh, the Russian public don't know about, well, almost don't know about that. This is not something that you publicize if you, if you uh, want to build what, what you call the sovereign democracy, with very much the emphasis on the first word, um, and that uh, military uh, equipment is traversing Russia on, 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 on rail track. Uh, so that, that, that's, uh, that is reset. It also means that uh, there is, a, um, I think, a, a serious... Um, um, chance of uh, changing the very nature of the relationship, which I think we, we need to be doing 20 years after the end of the Cold War, transforming the strategic relationship between the two countries, which is still adversarial at core, which is still uh, defined by the missiles uh, at that level. And uh, the missiles may have played a role when I was wearing my uniform, but uh, they have no role today. And uh, missile defense could be a game changer in the relationship, uh, changing it from uh, largely adversarial to a more cooperative relationship. And uh, if you have Putin as your partner, at least um, you're talking to the decision maker. And you're not talking to somebody who looks, um, is nice, but he will have to clear all his steps with the guy who sits in the back room, in the back office. And Putin has, has been, and still is today, essentially a, a back office manager. Mm -hmm. And his t salesman is, is, is operating in the front office. Um, Go ahead. No, right here in front, yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation today. Uh, my name is Ben Liga with the Internews Network. I was just wondering if you could comment um, in the coming years, in the face of this atomized society, what role do you think the media, and particularly social media, will play in, in reversing that, in starting to rebuild community connections? Well, I think that even today, the social media are playing a huge role. It's not, it's not just the social media, but the internet more broadly. Uh, as as, as uh, some people say there are two parties in Russia. One is called uh, the TV party, and the other one is called the Internet party. Uh, the TV party is the, is the Putin party. The Internet party, Medvedev wants to capture it, and he is, uh, he's, he's doing that on behalf, of course, of Vladimir Putin. Uh, but the Internet uh, cannot be captured just like this. The social media cannot be uh, mobilized in support of, uh, of, of, of state power. So uh, I, I think that, that uh, Russia is changing uh, fastest uh, in its, at, the, at its social level. Most people who read newspapers look at uh, what's happening at the political level. And uh, the more they look there, they, the more it looks the same. Uh, the more depressed they are. If you go down one notch at the economic level, there, there's something going on, but not as much as you would wish. Because the economic and, uh, and, and uh, the political are so closely tied in the Russian system, and, and in a way, very unfortunately tied. The kind of bind is, is, is very unfortunate for the country's development. But if you go one level deeper, if you go to the social level, then you will see tremendous change. Then you will see people, uh, especially the younger people, for whom uh, the world is totally different from the world where I grew in. Uh, for example, one of uh, one of the jokes that sent, and some of them may, some of you may remember that, uh, set thousands of people, hundreds of people uh, in a room laughing uh, when performed on stage. There was a famous comedian who said. Um, I need to go to Paris tomorrow on my private business. And people would be laughing at the Soviet Union because it was totally insane to talk about going to Paris tomorrow and on your private business. You're, you belong in a madhouse. Uh, when I relate that to my 30-year-old son today, 
um, he doesn't get it. <laughs> he says, so what? I mean, don't you have a, what, what's your problem? You don't have a visa? You don't have a ticket? Uh, it's over, there's overbooking? So what, what, what's the problem? Um, and that's, that's where, it, but for those people, the world is essentially borderless. And uh, they reach out to, uh, to a lot of opportunities around the world. And many of those Russians are voting against Russia. Hundreds of thousands of, of, of people, younger people, are leaving uh, on an annual basis uh, in pursuit of happiness, which is fine, which is great, which is what people uh, wished for. Only they're leaving Russia. I mean, they may return. No one is, no one is an emigre. You, people do not, the state does not withdraw your passport. It doesn't care, really. Uh, but the country gets um, uh, fewer, brighter minds. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a bit depressing to think of. But in, in, a, in a world of open borders, that's, that's the reality. You cannot keep people in one place uh, if they want to go elsewhere. And, and uh, the opportunities in Russia for a lot of people will be so much worse for a very long time. So you have to somehow factor that in. Uh, Gary Gzirian, Capital Trade Inc., International Trade Consultancy. Um, you uh, mentioned uh, that um, Russian people eventually uh, should, or was it a question, that they will become a nation or should become a nation. What would be the national idea behind it? What would be uh, national idea it would be based in? Ethnic doesn't look like, you know, there are Tatars, there are many other no. nations. <laughs> Uh, in some kind of ideological, uh, what would be that basis for creating a nation? Um, I think it will be uh, more like a neighborhood, only a very big neighborhood. Uh, you live in one place, more or less. You may call that place Moscow or, or a bar in Moscow, or you may call Russia your, your place. But um, somehow, you're, you're not bound together. You're not like in the Soviet Union. You can you know, get up and go. But if you decided to stay, it's best that you, um, that you collaborate with, with, with other people and, uh, and, and, and do something which is for the common benefit. The, uh, the, the basis for that uh, I, I think uh, you may uh, call it uh, civic nationalism or something. There, there's, a, there's a competitive spirit. Uh, the Cold War uh, is, uh, is over, clearly, but competition is not. And uh, for, um, for some people, there's, uh, uh, there's something in this notion of a Team Russia not only uh, in sports, but elsewhere. Let, let's, let's do it. Are we incapable of competing with anyone. Uh, then, there are other, then there are some pressures from the outside. Um, Russia is a fairly small place located on the periphery of, uh, of Great China. And uh, the, cha the, um, the change in fortunes and in position between Russia and China has been far more dramatic over the last 20 years than the change between Russia and, 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 and the United States. In the United States, it's always been up there and out there. You tried to catch up with it, but you knew it was. But China, you, you, you look down you, for, 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 for 300 years, or, or almost 300 years. There were lots of them, but they were backward and uh, disunited for a long period of time, lorded over by others, including us. And then all of a sudden, it changed tremendously. In 1979, when Deng Xiaoping started his reforms, uh, the GDP of China was 40% of the GDP of the Russian Soviet Republic. Nowadays, it's four times bigger. And uh, the big change happened within just 10 years. So that, that may be uh, another thing. Then you, you, will, you will need to define yourselves somehow 
because if you live in the city of Moscow, again, I, uh, it's, it's, very, it's very recent. I've always, not on the always, last nine years, I lived close to Moscow's central mosque, which is in central, just, just north of, 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 of the Garden Ring. Um, and uh, for, for many years, it was, you know, on, on, a, on a Muslim festival, there would be perhaps 100, 200 cars parked there, and people would, so not, not a big deal. Uh, more recently, I would say the last uh, two or three years, um, when, if you walked out uh, in, into the small lanes that lead from, from the mosque to the garden ring where I, where I live, uh, you see dozens of thousands of young people, very unfamiliar in their attire, in their, um, even their facial expressions to you. They would be speaking their own language. They would be totally, at this point, still unintegrated into Moscovite society. They would be, they would be behaving fine. They're not, uh, not doing anything, uh, you know, uh, that, would, uh, that would be objectionable. But the sheer size of those people and the, the suddenness of it all, uh, it brings you to the realization that you need to do something about that. You cannot expel those people because you can't live. You also, A, because they are, many of them are your own citizens. B, uh, there may be no Russians in, in, in Dagestan, well, in Chechnya, but there are more and more Chechens and more and more Dagestanis in Moscow. Right? So you, you, need to do, you need to relate to those people somehow, and you need to redefine your Russianness. The good thing about uh, this nation-building project is that it has uh, the imperial past behind it. So you, Russians, as, and I started with that, Russians were not ethnically conscious to the extent that other people were. So you could, uh, well, n no, ethnically. Well, Stal Stal no one in Russia, in his right mind, would, would say that Stalin was, was, you know, he was a foreigner. Uh, we're not about Stalin. No, Jasinski, I can give you Catherine the Great, I can give you all the names you want. And they were all Russian sovereigns, or Russian czars, or Russian dictators, as the case may be. Well, I think we're at the end of our time, so I thank everybody for coming. Uh, we have a lot to think about, I have to say. Listening to you today, having read the book, I'm more worried than ever. I don't see stability, but I hope you're right about the upside. Thank you, everybody, for coming. David, thank you so much.